we'll read in unison our opening prayer. Holy, Holy One, One, we, we come, come to you seeking, seeking the wisdom, the wisdom to, discern to discern what to hold on to and, and what to let go of. When, when we know, know what is, is no longer serving, serving us, we need the courage and the strength to, to make a change. Help us, Help us to release the thought patterns and behaviors that are keeping us from moving forward into a healthier ways of being. Comfort us in our moments of loss and doubt, because we know that letting go can be painful. May we offer this comfort and grace to all who are ready for transformation. And this brings us to our time in our service for our young and young at heart. I see some friends coming up to join me. I'll have a seat right up here. How are you all doing? Good. Hello. Are we a tired bunch today? <laughs> a little bit. Well, I wonder, what is your favorite food? Yeah. Baby back ribs. Baby back ribs. <laughs> what else? <laughs> Cheeseburgers. Ooh, a special mac and cheese. Do you have a favorite food? Too many to count? Well, oh, I like broccoli too. I always felt like that was a weird vegetable for. Okay, I'd eat it. Well, I bet John will have an extra difficult problem with this. What if I told you you could only eat one thing for your entire life? Would you pick your favorite food? Could you do baby back ribs over and over and over again? Yeah. Would that change the food that you pick? It's not healthy? Right. You're not getting a lot of veggies and chicken and rice. That. There are people that kind of live on chicken and rice around the globe. What else? Could you eat a cheeseburger for every meal forever? No. No? Is there a food that you could eat for every meal forever? Uh, yeah, there, there would be healthier meals. Broccoli and steak. That's got some protein, some veggies. Well, in the story that they're about to read in here, it's not quite forever, but the Israelites, we actually talked about the Exodus story in Sunday school a few weeks back, but it's been a while, so I don't actually think we touched on this exact topic, but what do you think they ate when they wandered in the desert for 40 years? Lizards? That's a good guess. <laughs> Yeah, so rather than having to eat cactus and lizards like you might expect in the desert, God provided for them, but did God provide really fancy steak and uh, ribs and cheeseburgers? No. no, God provided just enough for them to get by, just enough, and God said, in fact, because you can rely on me, I don't want you to gather anything extra than what you need, because you know... There's no need to keep leftovers if you're going to get it provided for you the next day, right? And so God said it was kind of a lesson that they could count on God, but maybe that they shouldn't uh, want the absolute most or the very best all the time. A way of relying on God with what they need and being willing to kind of sacrifice some of what they want for the sake of others and for God's sake. And I think that's a wonderful lesson that sometimes we might think it would be awfully nice. I bet there have been times where I've said, man, I could eat a cheeseburger every meal of every day, but I know that probably wouldn't be the best way to live, right? And God knows a better way to live, a life of, of gratitude for the things that we have, a life of reliance on God to provide for us. And I think we can learn a lot from that. Will you pray with me? And then we'll go down to Sunday school. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time to come together with our church family, and we thank you for the lessons of reliance, that we know that we can count on you to provide 
the things that we need and that we should uh, seek to provide that for others who are in need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you.
Our scripture lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, if you care to follow along on the screens. Stretching to the fullness of new potential, the butterfly begins to sense the calling to new heights. Expansion of wings, however, means something profound. It can never go back into the cocoon, not even if it wanted to. And so it is time to leave it behind. The Israelites that left Egypt were aching for freedom, yet when faced with the disorientation of all that was new and familiar, many began crying to go back. Letting go of the past requires deep trust in the God who has performed to be with us always. And from Exodus, the whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our bread a fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what we are, that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your bread of fill in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, Dad, but against the Lord. And do you know what Jesus Let does? us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The very first day to speak to God. I know someone who studied both theater and music while they were in college. And she learned a mantra while she was having those wonderful experiences. It goes something like this. Gulp, leap, soar. Gulp, leap, soar. Think you could say that with me? Gulp, leap, soar. Most worthwhile things in life involve risk. And when we are in that sort of difficult moment of risk, we might sort of counterintuitively think, well, gee, maybe I should just give up and, and not try. Despite all the preparation, you might be struggling with um, negative voices in the back of your mind telling you about all your shortcomings and why this won't work. So the first step is not to ignore that, but it's just to gulp, let it go, and move on. It's time to take all of yourself with you, she wrote, Walk across that stage for your monologue or your solo. It's time to uh, not be intimidated by the stareful gaze of those who are uh, evaluating you for the audition. It's time to sing your first note, speak your first word, or take your first step. You're on the precipice of greatness. Leap. It's only after you take the leap, as vulnerable and insecure as you might be, 
that you can soar. She goes on to say, the greatest talents on stage and screen all have stories of the pressure they felt, the fear that was involved in putting themselves out there. And the greatest talents themselves took a risk. They gulped, they leaped, and they soared. I wonder if butterflies experience anxiety before its maiden flight. To have undergone such momentous change from a, a, a caterpillar, caterpillar crawling along the ground to all of a sudden being in a chrysalis or a cocoon and then bursting out of that cocoon with wings that are unfurling and drying. What frame of reference would such a being have for flying? The butterfly's wings have dried, fully extended. It's now time to let go of the branch that they cling to and to soar. I think we find the Israelites in a very similar situation here in the 16th chapter of the book of Exodus. They're complaining. They're in the middle of what scholars call the wilderness wanderings. That is, after the plagues, after uh, the exodus out of Egypt, the Israelites are now free, and Pharaoh's army is no longer chasing them. And what's the first thing they say? Oh, if only we had died by the Lord's hands back in Egypt, everything would be better. They're complaining. At least in Egypt, we had plenty of food. We could eat our fill. And here we are in the wilderness now. The Israelites discover their first obstacle. They are unfamiliar with the challenges of the wilderness, and they knew well what it was like to be enslaved. The things that we know perhaps are less fearful to us than the unknown things that we experience. And there's a fear that can grow within us, particularly in the face of something we don't know and we don't understand. Perhaps the Israelite people, in their fear, thought the suffering that they could recognize in Egypt was more bearable than the unknown challenges they would encounter as a free people. So God gives them this unique opportunity to learn to trust. Just as they're pining away for what used to be, God showers them with the blessing of manna. That is bread that appears suddenly in the wilderness. And if you read through all of the 16th chapter, it's really quite remarkable. You know, they can gather enough for one day. If they gather more, they'll only have enough for one day. So the overachievers don't get more. And if there's something going on so someone can't gather as much as they need to sustain themselves, well, lo and behold, <laughs> that person too has enough. Everybody gets an omer of manna. God is dependable. God is faithful. God provides even in the midst of a complicated journey. In Egypt, the Israelites 
could eat their fill, but here in the wilderness they had to learn to trust. And God gave them what they needed until they made it to the land of promise. It's kind of like gulp, leap, and soar. Well, I got to tell you something. I have never been more proud to be a United Methodist than I am today. This past week, well, someone wrote it up beautifully. Without debate, the General Conference has removed the United Methodist Church's ban on the ordination of clergy who are self-avowed practicing homosexuals a prohibition that was put in the discipline in 1984. So during a mass meeting at, uh, on May the 1st, they voted to take all of that restricted language away. It is no longer against the discipline of the church for, for, for gay folk to be ordained, it is no longer against the discipline of the church for same weddings, same gender services to be a chargeable offense. And in fact, the vote was 692 in favor of removing the bans against 51 <laughs> who said no. That's 93%. And you can trust that math because somebody else did it and I didn't. <laughs> it's been a long journey since 19, the first ban was put in in 1972. And so we've struggled with that. But I'm delighted that we've made the change. I hope you don't mind my pointing out just a little bit of irony on a day of celebration. Where were you in the year 1974? What's that? You were here in 1974? <laughs> Is there anybody who wasn't born in 1974? <laughs> in 1974, I was in the eighth grade. And in 1974, the consensus of the medical establishment, the consensus of the Psychiatric Association said, whatever else homosexuality might be, we are certain that it is not pathological, we are certain it is not harmful, and we see no reason to judge it un favorably. It's in 1974. Those who are our brightest and our best and our, our most competent scholars who search and search and search spoke a word of clarity. And how ironic it is that in the year 2024, 50 years later, United Methodists have finally processed that new important information. Well, no point in lamenting the past. I am just delighted that we are now a very different church than we were. And I rejoice in that because everybody belongs, everybody has a place here that's very, very important to me, and I know it's very important to all of us in this room. And there was something else that they passed that did not get as much attention. See, one of the things that used to really irk me was that the church said I could not perform a gay wedding if I felt called to. But what, when we passed this legislation, we also said, but if a United Methodist minister is not comfortable 
performing such a service, they can simply choose not to, and there would be no negative consequences. They also passed legislation that said, if, your local if a local church is not yet ready to host such a celebration, that that is a local decision made by a local church. And I wonder, if when the more conservative voices had all of the power, if they had been that gracious, if they had simply said, while we disagree with you, you may do as you see fit, perhaps we would not have had to have 50 years of schism. And the schism that made all this possible was very costly. We lost probably one quarter of our congregations. But it's a day. It's a day to gulp, to leap, and to soar. A new future is breaking in upon us, a future that is more inclusive, that is more generous, that is less restrictive, and is more closely aligned with what we know to be the truth about God. And I rejoice in that. And I know that you rejoice with me. The butterfly only knew the stems and the leaves it crawled and feasted upon when it was a caterpillar. This moment, just before it takes flight, is so crucial. As the wings unfurl, but it's also crucial because of the proboscis. If there's a biologist in the room and I've mispronounced that, you can correct me later. Proboscis. It's a small tube that grows out of the butterfly's mouth. When, as a caterpillar, it ate sticks and leaves. But as a butterfly, this proboscis protrudes from its mouth and it draws out the sweet nectar of flowers. A butterfly learns a new way of being. When ready, the butterfly will experience the full reality for which it was created, spread wings and flying the sweetness of the nectar and the flowers of the earth. No more sticks and leaves. The Israelites only knew the certainty of enslavement. But in a critical moment of liberation, they trusted in the power of God. They gulped. They leaped and they soared. God's calling us to a new and a better day, calling us to leave behind the things we no longer need and embrace a future that is before us, a future that is glorious and filled with blessing. If we can gulp, leap, and soar. Amen. I do want to continue to express my gratitude for your uh, ongoing financial support. Some go to the church's website and follow the prompts for online giving. Others have arranged through their bank to have gifts sent and uh, send those regularly, and that's been very helpful for our cash flow. And if you came today with a gift that you'd like to share, the ushers will now wait upon us for our tithes and our offerings.
Accept, almighty God, these gifts which we, your people, offer, each an expression of our love and our longing, our love for you and a longing to be a part of your good work in the world. We pray in Christ's strong name. Amen. Please be seated. I did not see any prayer cards come in, so are there concerns that people would like to share? Again, as is our custom, if you say it aloud, I'll repeat it so everybody in the room can hear. Are there ways that we could pray for each other? Yes, Ginny. Yes, today's the walk, the, the, uh, walk for Project Red. And uh, I understand one of our very own uh, is going to be walking tomorrow. Cal, you're in our prayers. And Oh, really? It's been a, a long-term effort to raise money for world hunger, and uh, we're, we're delighted, Hal. Thank you, and thanks to all who are part of that team. Yes, Chris. Prayers for Lori. She's at uh, Care One and uh, coming to the close of her days. So she's surrounded by our love and our prayers. Yes, Barbara. Uh, for our nephew, Ben Ryan, who continues his amazing Continued prayers for Ben Ryan. Will the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh God, we look to you on this day of new possibilities. Acknowledging that as our wings dry and unfurl, we are a little anxious. Give us the courage to gulp, to leap, and to soar. We give you thanks for the journey of the United Methodist Church to the new possibilities and the new truths that we speak. Continue to lead us and guide us in faithful ways. Those who are sick, we pray for healing. To those who struggle, we pray for strength and peace. And we pray as we were taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> and without, our sudden responses will be the verses of the hymn, This is the Day of New Beginnings, number 819. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We're going to do uh, 2257 from the uh, hymn. From the, the small black hymn that we are. You don't have the words on the screen. 2257 A, B, C, and D.
You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life, imbuing us with all we need to navigate this life, to fly in the face of fear. When we doubt our ability to imagine our way out of despair, we have often turned away from you instead of toward you. You have time and again delivered us from our captivity to hopelessness, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and have spoken to us through your prophets. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Now let us proclaim the mystery of faith.
Lord, we give you thanks for this holy communion in which we are given gifts we cannot give ourselves. The presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, the hope of heaven, and the joy of earth. Amen. Our hymn is numbered 664 in the red hymnal, set forth by God's blessing, 664. Check that. In the black hymnal. <laughs> two, two? Uh, two, one, three, two. Two, one, three, two. go into your lives, leaving behind what no longer fits, and trusting in the promise that, yes, transformation is really possible. And may the assurance of the God who created you, the Christ who is raising you, and the Holy Spirit that will unleash you be with you now and always. Blessed be. Amen. Would you please be seated for the poster?
So.